So it's a, it's an absolute pleasure to to interview you and and connect with you, Salim, about your your father's legacy and and the foundation and all the work that you're doing with regard the archive. So the first question I wanted to kick off with was. Um, Africa has a long history of losing its archives to foreign countries, mainly through the colonial process. Um, and so with that background, why is it so important that your father's archive remains in Kenya and the continent? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Paul, for having me on, on, on the, uh, you know, doing the interview and having me on, on the feature in us on this. It's, it's such a pleasure and such a big fan of the work that you guys are doing. Um, and uh, so on this, I mean, you know, a lot of the archive that's been lost from the continent is because we haven't had the ability to preserve it. So it was very easy for, you know, British, um, the British Library or BBC uh, to, to pick up content in the guise of digitizing or helping to preserve it and never returning it to the continent. Same with the French in, in, in French speaking, uh, the, the French speaking parts of the continent and the Portuguese and others. So we've always had this, this history because as you rightly said of our colonial uh, heritage, we've all, we've had this, this, this um, trend of losing our content and, and actually, you know, in a way, I'm, I'm glad that it happened because we did not have the ability to preserve it. Government institutions did not have the ability, the knowledge, the know-how, uh, the equipment, the personnel, the technology to be able to preserve this content. So even though it's not in the continent, I'm glad that it's out there somewhere and it's been digitized, it's been looked after, there's metadata on it and hopefully you know, we can at some point bring this content back or at least copies of this content back. Um, in terms of my father's archive, <clears throat> it's very important that it stays here for us, obviously, because we also don't think, because it's not digitized and there's not metadata on all of the, on all of the images or the video, um, nobody else can actually um, caption everything that's that's there. So we need to keep it here in order because the, the institutional knowledge is still here. People that worked with my father for the best part of 40 years, um, you know, are still our archivists and librarians. So they have a lot of institutional knowledge and background on the history of these photos, when they were taken, who was in them, etc. So it's important for that to be to, to stay here. Um, we want to make it accessible to young people on the continent. Uh, to be able to learn about the continent's history, uh, political history in particular. And so, again, we think it would be most beneficial. But I'm not averse to the idea of digital versions of it being in other parts of the world. I think the, the entire world can benefit from learning a little bit more about African history through his work. Great, great. Thanks so much for that. Um, and just some background on your on your on your dad. I mean, you know, he started humbly in Dar es Salaam. Um, he's the son of a um, a railway worker. So please share with us how his 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 background and and his past uh, influenced his work and and what what prompted his journey to take off in such a monumental way. Well, I think, you know, I, I think he, at a young age, he, he understood the power of photography. Um, I think he understood being able to capture moments um, in, in time uh, for forever using photography as a medium. And, and he started off doing sort of pictures in school because, and he, again, it was, there was also a financial element to the whole thing. You know, he, 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 you know, he was from a very poor family, very poor background, so making money was also important to him. And he realized there was an opportunity because um, uh, photographers from newspapers in Dar es Salaam were not allowed to come into the school grounds. So they weren't allowed to come and take photos of activities that happened in the school. So he kind of saw this as a bit of a, ooh, an opportunity that if I can shoot some of this, that I can sell these pictures to the local newspapers and make you know a few shillings um, here and there. And that's what he started doing. And, and that's how he kind of uh, made a little bit of money, managed to buy his own little camera 
when he was about 13 years old um, and, and realized that somehow got into that. I wouldn't say there was an epiphany or, or something like that, but realized that this was a good career, could be a really interesting career. And I think he just enjoyed telling stories of people um, and pursued it, fortunately. And, um, you know, he's, um, he was born at a time when, when the continent was going through an enormous amount of, of change. You know, independence was coming to all the, the, the East African countries. He was right in the middle of that. There was a lot going on. Uh, the Cold War was at its, at its peak between, between Russia and, and the US. And so there was a lot happening. Um, and I think it was a good time for him to, to kind of take up photography and get, you know, using local knowledge and his, you know, local languages. He was able to get into places where perhaps foreign correspondents would have more difficulty accessing um, using his local network. So, you know, he developed that and that was kind of, you know, that was kind of where he kicked off. And, and as soon as he left school, he, he you know, started um, taking uh, pictures for foreign, you know, for international newspapers like the Times and the Telegraph and others because they didn't have local stringers unlike they do now. Uh, they didn't have many people on the continent. So he managed to get, you know, contacts with them posted and mailed off his pictures, you know, started receiving these small checks of five pounds or four pounds and, 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 and you know, started building a career like that. And, uh, and at some point, very early on, somebody said, well, you can make more money doing uh, video as well or doing film in those days, filming. Um, and so he was like, oh, that, that's, that sounds good. More money was always a good thing. So then he started, you know, he borrowed a Bolex um, uh, camera from from somebody and started, you know, doing film at the same time as doing stills of the same event. Um, you know, fashioned a little rig that would allow him to mount a Bolex and a couple of stills cameras so he could simultaneously shoot uh, oh. the same event uh, for different people. You Amazing. know, and and, uh, and you know, and, and then uh, his big break came um, came well. His first world exclusive came uh, on Zanzibar. Um, where he covered the revolution and, uh, you know, the Johnny O'Kello, this Ugandan mercenary that, uh, that, 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 that um, uh, started, did the first coup in Zanzibar to get rid of the, um, the uh, sultanate, uh, the sultans of, uh, that, that were from Oman that used to run Zanzibar. So Johnny O'Kello was a Ugandan and he somehow managed to fashion this coup and, um, and dad managed to get on the island again using his contacts, using his local knowledge, film it. And that was his first sort of exclusive um, that, uh, that really kind of got international media talking about him and, and understanding that he existed. Um, and that sort of started everything off. That's great, that's great. I mean, one also associates uh, another photographer um, um, and it's intriguing just to know if your, your, your dad and him Cross paths, and that's Priya Ramraka. Yes, was, Priya and was, him were very good friends. Okay, so just tell we us a little bit of how, because they have sort of similar similar trajectories. Um, yes. Uh, so just share with us that relationship. So Priya and, and Dad were very good friends. They, especially when Dad moved to Kenya, um, and they became very close friends. They did many of the same stories together, Djibouti, a few other countries together. Um, Priya was primarily a stills photographer, didn't shoot, didn't shoot film. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, they were discussing Biafra because they were both going to, to Nigeria uh, for Biafra. And they, were, they, were, they went together, they flew there together. Um, and Priya wanted to go in on, uh, I think it was the rebels side. And dad kind of weighed up the risk and thought it would be safer to go in on the government side. And so they both left Lagos and, and went on separate things, came, came back at exactly the same time, except Priya was in a coffin, um, having been caught in a crossfire, um, uh, you know, between the rebels and the, and the government forces. And so they were on opposite sides of the conflict. Um, and dad obviously didn't know that, that Priya had been caught up in this until he, he, he got back to Lagos and then 
brought him back to Nairobi. That's extraordinary. Um, but, That's extraordinary. Yeah, but they were they were very good friends, and again, Priya was an amazing, amazingly gifted photographer. Mm. Really, has some incredible content. Mm. Um, but very young again, you know. And and this was, you know, Dad knew that a lot of the decisions that he made were luck. A lot of it had to do with just plain luck. And and you know, he started being called Mo's luck because he happened to be in the right place, right time, <clears throat> you know, on the right side. But a lot of it also had to do with, you know, he took a lot of time assessing situations before he went to. A lot of people have this image of him that he was this, you know, cowboy, um, you know, fearless uh, photojournalist that went everywhere. But there was a lot of planning that went on in terms of his, his where he went, deciding where he went, uh, how he went, who he went with, and most importantly, how he got out. He never went anywhere without knowing how he was going to get out of the place. There always had to be an exit plan. Um, because as far as he was concerned, no matter how much he loved news, there was no photograph, there was no story that was worth dying for. Um, and one of his favorite sayings that I always remember, he said, look, I'm not afraid of the bullet with my name on but I, would, I do not want to die with the one that says to whom it may concern. You know, so it was, it was you know, I, he said, I don't want to die by being stupid or being unlucky. If my time has come and I've taken all the right precautions, but still I am unlucky because, you know, that's my time, fair enough. Okay. But I don't want to go into a place half cocked, half informed, just to try and get... And that's unfortunately what the problem is nowadays. This is why we're losing so many photojournalists um, and journalists around the world now is there's a lot of young people that are trying to make their name that um, have got very little experience. They're going into conflict zones, war zones, where they have very little knowledge, local knowledge of the places. Um, but they know that if they don't get that photograph or that piece of footage, or that exclusivity, then a lot of them are freelancers. They're not going to get paid unless they get the, the bang bang. And so they're taking bigger and bigger risks, you know. And, and unfortunately, um, now photographers, photojournalists, camera people, they are targets in a lot of these, these places. They're not seen as independent observers and people who are there to tell stories and just get the word out. They're seen as targets. Uh, this kind of started off with Bosnia and and Yugoslavia in, in the 90s where there was bounties put out on journalists. And so it's become a much more dangerous, um, a much more dangerous profession to, to get into now and, and the lack of experience. Plus, you know, when he was operating, there was so much more time to get stories out. There wasn't this 24 hour beast of television news. There wasn't the internet where you needed to post things instantly you know, where you needed to have, they had more time to go into places, to plan, mm. to do the, 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 the photography or the filming, to get the content out, to think about the stories. And, and so therefore there was more context and depth and, 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 and richness in the stories that they brought out rather than what it is now, which is just, you know, it's just fast food journalism. Yeah. But I mean, your, your, your dad must have had an extraordinary capacity and ability to, to organize and see the, the, the bigger picture because, um, as you're saying, I mean, um, there's a tendency to romanticize that time, but it was very, very tough, um, very ris risky. And, um, you know, he getting the images and getting them out was a, an amazing awesome. skill. Was an art form in itself, and he, and he, I mean, he utilized his contacts. You know, because he had, he was born and raised in this part of the world, he had a lot of contacts. He, you know, again, luckily because of the time, he went to school with a lot of people that ended up becoming, you know, powerful people in politics or in in government in different countries. So he visited them and went to school with them and became friends with them. So he had this wonderful contacts book. Of, of people that would help him with information, with access, with the ability to get in and out of places. He understood how conflict areas worked. He understood that the chances are you would have a car, but you wouldn't have fuel. 
So he would always travel with fuel, you know, and he would make sure that he had jerry cans of fuel so he could get, you know, get access. He knew that, you know, that, that you would, you, you, you know, you might not be able to find X, but you could get Y. So, you know, he, he made friends with people at the broadcasting station so that he could get his content out. You know, he would, he would, you know, one of the things that he used to do for years and years and years was print calendars, <clears throat> um, you know, camera picked calendars. Every year we would do these lovely calendars with beautiful pictures about Africa. And he only printed them to give them away to customs officials, to people at broadcast, because for some reason, we love calendars on this continent. A lot of Africans used to just die for calendars and diaries and stuff like that. They just want them to hang them on their house wall and whatever. So they love these things. And he was like, okay, I, it doesn't cost me a lot to print these calendars. It's my photos. <coughs> it's a fairly simple design. So, you know, this is a good, this is good currency to have. And it worked in getting equipment in and out of airports and, you know, not having to pay duty and, and getting, you know, your feed to work from a broadcasting side and nobody else's feed to work, you know, from there. So they'd have to hire him to get their pictures out, but he would always be first because his pictures went out first. So there was a lot of wheeling and dealing that he did as well, but he did it because he knew how the system worked and, and he was ruthless when it came to news. He was absolutely ruthless. He wanted to be the first person to have content, uh, to have his pictures up. That was simple fact. Plim was, was, you know, he wanted to be the absolute first. And he knew that was what was going to keep him relevant, was by being able to get access to places that other people couldn't. Great. So, I mean, you know, understanding Mo Amin as the photojournalist, uh, the, the cameraman on the front line, is very much part of his oeuvre, but the, his archive also comprises of, of um, a, you know, diverse, diverse range of, of material, wildlife, culture, uh, and many works that went beyond the headlines. Could you elaborate on, on, on this, this other, other well, it, version it, of his it, work? It goes, yeah, it goes back to, again, also the, the, the sort of commercial aspect of things. You know, he couldn't, he knew he couldn't just make a living. In those days, he couldn't just make a living being one type of a photographer or, 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 or covering one particular genre of content. So he knew that, you know, he loved nature and wildlife. So going to the game park on a weekend that he wasn't covering a new story was fun for him. Um, and it was a way to unwind. But he also knew that every photograph that he took, he could potentially sell or create something from it, whether it was to National Geographic, and in the end, creating books. Um, so actually about 70% of our archive is not news, it's not politics, it's actually wildlife, people, um, cultures, flora, fauna. I mean, he climbed Kilimanjaro seven times, he did a book on Kilimanjaro, he did Mount Kenya half a dozen times. I mean, to me, the capacity of the man to get around so many places and churn out so much content in such a short period of time is, is phenomenal. I mean, he was literally clicking all the time. I remember going to game parks with him on the weekends when I was very young and we would go as a family to the game park. It just, I mean, I was so bored because I had no patience to sit in front of a pride of lions. You know, he'd find a pride of lions. And he would just sit there for like eight hours because he knew that at some point they were going to kill because the size of the pride was so big, they were going to have to kill. And that's the photos that he wanted. The action photos was, was you know, the pride going for a zebra or wildebeest or something like that. But for me, it was like, okay, you've seen the lion. Jesus, let's just get on with, you know, it was boring, it's hot. It's just sitting in this car. Same with elephants, you know, he wanted, he would piss them off so much because he wanted that charging shot. So he would, he would, you know, rev the car and hoot to really get them riled up so that they would charge the car so he could get that picture of them charging. And, you know, he'd have to switch off the car because he didn't want, it was an old Land Cruiser. So, he, you know, he didn't want it to be, you know, shaking about with the photo. So he'd have to switch it off. The damn thing didn't start 
you know, most of the time when you start it. So this elephant is charging, he's clicking away, and then the bloody car doesn't start, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm screaming in the back, and he's telling me to shut up. And so, you know, I don't think I've been to a game park since he died, because I just like, I don't want to see another elephant. I don't want to see another rhino, I don't want to see another lion. But this, he, you know, for someone who was so, um, <clears throat> so ruthless in the, in the news arena, and in the front line to have so much patience when he was in doing wildlife and nature um, to have such an incredible amount of patience was quite something to see it was completely against his nature and his character when he was in the front line but he had this you know and we've got some incredible content of, of wildlife I mean, he wasn't a great wildlife photographer again he wasn't a great photographer period technically he wasn't the best photographer by any stretch of the imagination, you know, but he just knew the right place and the right time to be someone and the right access. But technically he wasn't that great. He kept working to improve himself, um, but he never took and taken any formal photography lessons. He hated studio work because studio was much more technical involving lights and and, and, you know, and filters and things like that. He never got into that because he didn't know. That's a wonderful uh, answer. Thanks so much. Um, and I, I think you've kind of answered this question already, but um, maybe you can just elaborate because he's kind of understood as a photojournalist, but he also has this uh, remarkable filmmaking career. Um, and just you know how did his his career evolve from photographer to cameraman to documentary filmmaker again as i said earlier it was you know it started off as a financial thing where somebody said you know you can make more money shooting film than you can just shooting stills so that's how it started and i think he really enjoyed doing both and he never went anywhere without both he would always shoot video when it evolved from film to video uh, as well as still simultaneously. Um, and throughout his career, that was the case. It was never, he was never without his stills camera. And I think stills photography was his passion and his first love. That was more than the, the, the television side. But he also understood that you can tell a lot of stories better with motion picture. You can, you can do a lot of storytelling in a very different way with video. And he found video quite easy or film quite easy because again, um, for the photography side, he knew that there was one shot and one shot was the money, was the money shot. You know, if you didn't have that shot, then, you know, that, that was it. You, you know, you, you didn't have the story, whether it was somebody cutting a ribbon or somebody, you know, a handshake or something. But with video, you had much more um, uh, uh, leeway to make mistakes, to miss things. You could, you could, you could still blend together a five minute piece. Um, even if you didn't capture the essential elements of it. So, you know, he found it a lot easier and, and throughout his life it was, you know, he was known as six camera mo. So he always carried, you know, multiple cameras with him because he knew that he could do something with every format. And, and with regard to his filmmaking, you know, what do you consider um, the highlights of, of his career? I mean, I would say that uh, Ethiopia and the famine were, were, you know, was probably that was definitely the biggest story of his career. And the stills did not make as much of an impact as that television piece that went out on the BBC that um, that started Band Aid and We Are the World and Live Aid and, and that global movement. I don't think even stills could tell that kind of a story uh, as 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 how that that piece was put together, the video, the, the, the Michael Burke's audio and, and his sound, uh, his voiceover. Um, it was just, a, you know, it's almost like a perfect piece of, of television that, that, um, that, that, you know, changed the world in many ways. Um, so that would, to me, would be the, the, the highlight of his, of his um, career. And in terms of, of, of video making, uh, you know, even the, the, the day that he lost his arm in Ethiopia in 1991, um, you know, that filming, the, the film of that explosion um, is, is quite, you know, unique and spectacular. 
because he had, you know, the camera was rolling when, when the explosion went off. But the stills cameras saved his arm because he had his stills cameras over his left shoulder. He was carrying, he had his camera bag and, and, and two cameras outside the bag on his left shoulder. He had the video camera on his right shoulder. So when the, when the RPG hit his left hand, it went through the hand into the camera bag. So it would, if the camera bag hadn't been there with the lenses and everything else, that would have gone straight through him. So he would have died instantly. So that saved his life. Then the, the straps of the, of the stills camera wrapped themselves around his arm and formed a tourniquet. So it stopped the blood loss as well from, from the, the part that was gone. So the stills camera saved his life that day as well. Sure. What a story. Um, so with the untimely passing of your father in 1996, the archive has been left to you. And what are the challenges you face in preserving his legacy, which namely are three million photographs and thousands of hours of footage, and ensuring his work is left for future generations? I mean, the biggest challenge is digitizing it, is getting it into some order so that it is it's digitized for preservation purposes and it's digitized so that we can do things with it to make it accessible to people around the continent and around the world so that, that hopefully they can learn. So the, 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 the end goal of this archive is to digitize as much as we can that's relevant, put the right amount of metadata. That's another challenge that, you know, while he shot a lot of pictures, he wasn't always the best at putting good captions on them. So there's some images that have very little information. So we would have to get researchers to, to, to dig into where, you know, to get more information on that. And, um, and uh, the video is actually very well logged. He was quite, um, you know, uh, uh, very particular about having log sheets for every single thing um, and, and having time codes and doing everything on that. So the video is actually much better shape. But the idea is to get this content um, you know, uh, digitized, uh, uh, metadata, and then to create some sort of curriculum um, or modules, educational modules that can be given to primary and secondary schools across Africa, public schools that probably will never have access to this content uh, any other way, and, and give young people an opportunity to study their continent's history, their country's history, their continent's history, using audiovisual content that he produced. Um, because one of the things that I've noticed looking through his content is that he is, um, he was very objective in what he, and in how he covered things. There was no agenda. He didn't have an agenda of making somebody look good or making a particular place look different to what the reality was. He photographed and filmed what he saw. And so it gives you a lot of, scope to make your own opinions about those particular times in history by looking through his content. And that's what we want to do is not alter how he did things, but just to put it out there as raw as possible, but obviously in some format that is easy to follow and, um, and you know, get, get young people to, to really make their own minds up about the history of this continent. What was wrong? What was right? Who was wrong? Who was right? Where did, where, what things happened that changed the course of the continent's history and what can be done to, to improve the continent. So could you just elaborate a bit more on how um, you wish to present that, that legacy in the archive? Um, you know, is it going to be a website? Is it going to be, you know, a number of, you know, how are you going to narrate this very extensive? It's actually article? a very good it's a very good question, Paul, and I'm, I'm not sure of the answer because we're not, edu we're not in education, it's not our business. So I don't know how the formats will be. It seems like formats are changing all the time in terms of how content is presented to young people in schools, whether it's on you know, iPads, whether it's on, uh, online, whether it's on its preloaded content. Um, whether bits and pieces are taken and put into a curriculum. It, it seems there's all these different formats that are there. 
and available. So we would leave that to people that know much more than we do about education and how and how the the the, the content needs to be formatted to reach the audience that we want it to reach. I mean, I think kids that are in you know countries like South Africa, which is perhaps much more advanced in terms of technology, um, or definitely in Europe or in the U.S., they would consume this content in a very different way to how you know kids in Benin or Mali or or um, you know maybe uh, you know South Sudan or other places might consume this or be able to consume this. So I think we, there, there's no one way to do it. I think there's multiple ways to present the content, <clears throat> but the first step is to get it digitized in some format that it can be worked on <clears throat> to find what the exact, the best places are, that the best content is that the countries are the, are the most covered on. So related to that, and in the absence of local resources to take care of invaluable photographic archives, like your father's, how do you envisage the Moamin project being sustainable for national, continental, and world heritage in the future? Again, I, I, I think, you know, there's, we look at a few options. There are organizations like Google that, you know, might be able to help digitize and um, store the content, um, which, are, which are two big costs. In, in, in doing it um, because they want it as part of their arts and culture project or, or something like that. I'm sure there are other uh, organizations like Google that, that may be interested in this kind of stuff. UNESCO, I, I believe, is uh, also looking at their world heritage um, projects to look at content uh, as part of, of, of preserving, preserving content as part of their legacy or their mandate as well. Um, so I think getting in involved with some of these organizations is, step, is, is, is a step forward. Um, what we've got to do is we've got to let people know that this archive exists as well. There's not a lot of people that know it exists, especially amongst the last two generations. Um, most of them have never heard of Muhammad Abid and would not know that this content is out there and exists. So we've got to bring that back to the forefront of people's minds, whether it's in the forms of, of doing exhibitions or um, curating for galleries or doing books or anything like that, any of these ways to be able to, to bring attention to the fact that this archive is here. And hopefully then the right people, you know, it comes to the attention of the right people. And I mean, the money to us is a lot of money to do this, to, the, in the grand scheme of things, it's a it's a drop in the ocean in terms of what the archive is sitting there for. So you need, you know, if we, we get a philanthropist that really likes this this content. I mean, for them to drop, you know, a couple of million dollars to do this, it's peanuts for them to, to do this. Um, so you know, we but we need to get to them. We need to make people aware that this exists, um, and and so that we're just doing whatever we can to do it. You know, there's there's we're trying to see if we can get a film made on his life or a, a series and you know, anything that will raise the profile of what he did and, and who he was and how this content was captured, I think will only help our cause. Great, and, and just the final question is, um, I'm aware of the family and the Mohammed Amin Foundation in the spirit of his legacy um, support local photographers and also run other philanthropic um, initiatives. So please share with us how the foundation is, is, is doing this. So the foundation was set up in 1999. So we've been going for almost 20, uh, what's 2009? Yeah, about 22 years, almost 21 years. And it initially was, was set up to train young African journalists. Uh, from around the continent to to get their skills is more of a technical training center so to get their skills up to be on par with anywhere else in the world uh, because again one of my father's pet peeves was you know the fact that african journalists weren't being used to tell african stories it was always journalists being parachuted in from other countries outside the continent to tell our story 
And the excuse was always that, oh, you know, the level of skill is not available in Africa. The camera people are not good enough. The sound people are not good enough. The photographers are not good enough. The equipment is not good enough. The, you know, the sound engineers are not good enough. And he got so tired of hearing that because he was an example of being the best in the world at what he did, you know, and he was from the continent, you know, self-taught. So he knew the talent was there, um, but perhaps, you know, we needed a little bit of a boost in terms of technical training to make us, you know, of that standard. So that's what the foundation did. And we trained over, you know, over 500 journalists in that time, very small classes so that they could get, um, they could get personalized uh, training and they could um, uh, uh, learn to the very best international standards. We had a hundred percent employment record. Every single graduate either went on to, to find, uh, you know, really good employment uh, around the continent. Some went to Hollywood, some went um, to the UK and other parts of the world to continue film. Some set up their own companies, production companies. So that was the passion for behind that. That was the, the initial idea behind it. A couple of years ago, it became increasingly more difficult to find funding because it's set up as a not-for-profit organization. It became increasingly difficult to find funding for trade. Um, so we then kind of went into a hiatus to think about what else to do with the foundation. Then last year, I decided that we would fold the archive into the foundation because it was his archive. Um, it's his foundation is in, in his name. So better to put the, the archive into the foundation. Um, it gave us the ability to then engage with people like Google and others who cannot work with commercial entities, but can work with not-for-profits. Um, so we put the archive in. And the idea is that we will also be able to start training archivists. I think that's such a huge gap on the continent to have properly um, trained young African archivists that understand how to digitize, understand how to put metadata, understand how to um, uh, run a media asset management system, how to preserve this content, you know, what formats to scan in, what formats to digitize in. Um, so we think that that would be a great skill to start teaching um, young people. So the archive combined with, so if we get some funding from an organization, we then put that funding towards bringing in students that can, that can then learn um, about digitization and, and archive. Great. That, that's, 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 uh, that's, that's a 